start the recording like this. Uh, okay. Can yeah. I say one thing? Yeah. Uh, which is a key difference between uh, Agda and Haskell is a bit of attitude about the relationship between things and their types. Haskell's very much, the culture is type inference. A thing has a type and you look at the thing to figure out what its type is and, it's, and it has one type. Whereas uh, in Agda culture, it's the other way around. You start from the type and then you try and make sense of the things. And that sometimes means that the same thing can be made sense of in different types. And that's one of the things that causes confusion with Nat and Finn, particularly when we call the constructors of both of them zero and suck. You have to get used to thinking, uh, what type am I looking from when I look at a thing? Yeah. So uh, Nat makes sense of zero and suck always. Uh, whereas thin N makes sense of zero or suck only if N's big enough. It's, it's deliberately using the same notation because they're morally numbers. It's just thin N contain numbers that happen to be smaller than N. Yeah. So, so let's see if we can make sense of, of that formally. So we had this fin definition, zero and suck. Um, and we also, like Connor said, we have the natural numbers, which is also defined to be zero and suck, right? And, and what we are trying to say is that these zero and suck here are only allowed if, if the n is big enough. So zero only makes sense if the n is a suck of something. And if you do a suck, then you increase the bound, right? So this index here is the upper bound of, of what the things can be. Yes, or, or the other way of looking at it is to say that a successor can get under suck n if the thing is the successor of the predecessor fits under n. Yeah. Um, so we could try to actually really make this precise and say, OK, a thin n is exactly a natural number which is smaller than n, right? Yes. So let's see if we can do that. Yeah. So the first thing we then have to do is we have to explain what smaller than means, right? Yeah. So I'm going to start by defining the smaller than relation on the natural numbers. Um, OK, yeah. and as we said before, if you're coming from Haskell, you might expect this to take two numbers and give us back a Boolean to say if, if it's true or false that, uh, that the first one is smaller than the other. But here in Agda, we want to have evidence that something is smaller, right? We don't just want to have a random Boolean. Yeah. So we're going to return a set of evidence that the first number is smaller than the second one. Yeah, uh, we'll, we'll get back to th that Boolean will reappear at some point in a slightly different shape. But uh, for now, we're actually asking what would convince us that one number is smaller than another? Yeah. Here, you'll also see practical uses of the empty type any minute now. Yeah. OK, Look. so I define this. I, I take two arguments, and then I have to say what, what is defined as, right? OK, and the goal down here is to give a set. You should uh, think of it as ask, what would, what would convince you that n is less than m? At the moment, we don't know enough about n or m. Yeah. So, so I, to say. I don't think I know what, what this set should be yet, but I can pattern match on n and m, and that's going to give me more than an idea, right? So I'm going to do that. I'm going to pattern match on both of them. I will. <laughs> yeah. uh, and maybe that's a bit hasty. Maybe I could get away with just pattern matching on one and not the other. But uh, if I'm just being simple-minded, then these are the four cases I have to consider, right? Each one of them is either zero, or a successor. Um, OK, that's fair. We can tidy it up later. Yeah. Premature optimization considered harmful. Uh, OK. Uh, so now I have to say, OK, what would it take for me to be convinced that zero is less than zero? And that's what I should define this to be here, right? Well, zero is never less than zero. I mean, so I'm, I'm making this up now, right? 
I'm giving meaning to this definition, but I have some idea of what I want it to be. I want it to be the usual definition of less than or the natural numbers. Um, so it's, it's strict. Uh, and it's the strict uh, order. Not less than or equals, it's strictly yeah. less than. Zero is not strictly less than zero. Yeah. So then here I can say, well, this should be false. So I can use the, the evidence that zero is less than zero are all the elements of the empty type, right? Which are no elements. Right. Zero should never be less than zero. So I can define so, yeah. that to be that. Yeah. So if you want to translate that into English, what this says is there is no way to convince me that zero is less than zero. This is this is the type of impossible. There's no there's no evidence. There's no way to deliver evidence of that. Okay. And then I can move on to my next goal, which is saying I have to define what does it mean for zero to be less than suck of m. And this case, in this case, I'm I'm really easy to please, right? Because zero is always going to be less than a suck in, in my mind. So I can say that in order to, for you to give me evidence that zero is less than suck of m, well, it's enough if you give me something in, in the unit type. So to translate this into English again, what we're saying is it is obvious that zero is less than suck m. Right. No effort required. Direct. Zero versus suck. Instant win. Yeah. But the other way around, what does it mean? For suck n to be less than zero, well, that should again never be true, right? So I'm going to say, well, if you want to convince me of that, you have to give me an element of the empty type, which you probably struggle to do. So then we only have one case left, which is to say, what does it mean to give evidence that suck n is less than suck m? So this is n plus one, and this is m plus one. Any ideas? N plus one. Yeah. yeah, so 7 is going to be less than 9 if and only if 6 is less than 8 and so on, right? Until we get down to a base case, which is hopefully where you have yeah. a zero on the left and a suck on the right. Yeah, we just take a potato off each pile Sorry. until one pile becomes empty. So we can do a recursive call, and this is an okay recursive call because we are, we are actually decreasing in both arguments, right? So we are definitely going down, and this is definitely going to terminate. So I'm just going to be happy with that definition. Right. And then uh, having, having done it, though, let's just look at all the things way. We can have a quick look to see, can we make this a little tidier? Um, look at the two false cases. Yeah, we, we can kind of look at it from right to left, right, and see, do we have the same value for mul multiple cases and we see that we have false in two cases and then we can go looking on the left and see what's the common pattern for these false cases and we see that it is exactly when we have a zero here on the right, right? it is never the case that anything is strictly smaller than zero so we could fix this up by hand or we could pattern match again but i yeah, think the claim up. yeah this is a good thing to do yeah so if the second argument is zero, then it doesn't matter what the first one is. We are always going to return false, right? So I'll change the first one to just say, okay, it's an N, I don't care which one. And I remove this one. Then I reload. And thankfully, Agda is not saying missing cases, so I didn't mess right. that up. There's a subtle thing. It might be worth just seeing what happens if you move the first line to the last. Okay, so I just moved it around. Right. Uh, I don't know if you can see from there, but the background color here has gone a very slightly darker shade of white. And that's Agda warning you that uh, you can't take this equation quite for granted because it looks like we want a pattern match on the, the left argument first. So this is Agda is saying, I'm going to be stricter than this because I need to look at the first argument to see if either of these two equations applies. So there's no getting out of it. I, I can't just uh, rewrite when I see this, any old stuff here. So these equations are prioritized. And the, you have to get 
I mean, figuring out what's going to compute and what's not is sometimes going to be important. And the general message is put the lazier, lazier equations nearer the top. So, because uh, what this is really going to, these programs translate into a process of poking the data and saying, which constructor are you? So being strict. What we're saying here is, if we put this line first, we look at the thing on the right before we look at the thing on the left. The actual mechanism that's operational here is, look at the thing on the right. If it's zero, done. False. Otherwise, it's a successor. Now look at the thing on the left. If that's zero, then hooray, trivial. Otherwise, if it's two successors, go again. So we're building. So you need to be sometimes a little bit careful about what the mechanism is that you've created. Strictness matters. And if, if you ever find yourself in this situation where you have this little dark uh, light gray and you, would exp you want this equation, then the way to, to get out of your trouble is always to pattern match more on the end where you use this. Right. Yeah, so what, because what happens, you'll, you'll find, especially when Agda lets you do electric case splitting so easily, you'll find that you can always ask for more information. So what happens we find with students is that you often start out by writing programs that do much more pattern matching than you actually need and repeat the same logic in multiple cases. And then when you come to do the proofs about the programs, doing the proof forces you to split your proof into the same cases as your program. And if you've built, if you put, if you split your program into too many cases, then your proofs will get more complicated. Uh, so to some extent, it's a crime that is its own punishment. But, uh, you know, what Agda programmers do is get, get the meaning right first and then try and optimize for fewer cases just to make proofs easy. So don't be, don't be afraid to kind of go scattergun on case analysis to get where you want to go, but then do think about cleaning it up. Okay, so we define can the last... See, can we see some examples first, maybe? Right. Concrete okay. numbers. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Okay, so we can see an example of... What's your favorite number, Guillaume? Six. Six. Okay, what's your second favorite number? Is, I don't know, seven. Seven, okay. <laughs> right. So let's see what it would mean to convince me that six is less than seven. Right, so look at the goal. And we see that I have to give an element of the unit. Type. Maybe just increase the font size. Yeah, that's what I had. Frame. Yeah, but yeah. So it, uh, this program really computes. And because we've got actual numbers that make it all the way, we, get, we do get all the way down to zero. And, uh, and it turns out to be no bother, but the other way around. Uh -huh. So yes, seven less than six. Well, to give a proof of this, you just have to give a proof of the empty type, right? Which isn't really yes, easy. Yes, but correspondingly, if someone ever tells you that seven is less than six, and asks you to do some work because of that. Yeah. You so can... you could also say, okay, what does it mean to give a proof that seven is not less than six? So I put a neg in front here, right? Aha, uh -huh. parentheses and required. Put some parentheses <laughs> in, and then we look at the goal. Then before I normalize the goal, it just says what it is. If I fully normalize it with control U, control U, uh, then we see that the negation has turned into an implied bottom, and the seven less than six has turned into a bottom. So in this case, there's, well, I guess there's two ways you can do this. You could either say, well, if you give me a proof of false, I will give you a proof of false. Uh, or I can say, if you give me a proof of false, then I'm going to see you and raise you an absurd <laughs> pattern matching on this proof of false. And both gives me what I want. Right. Um, so that's how you can, if you, if someone gives you something impossible, that then it's you have your get out of jail free card, right? 
Uh, okay, that's good. Uh, so now let's see if we can use this to define another way to represent fin n, which I'm going to call fin prime n. And now I'm going to make precise this idea that we are saying a fin n is a natural number which is strictly smaller than n. Uh, so that sounds like something you can do using this sigma type. So remember that the sigma type was the type of pairs of a first component and then something in the second component which can depend on the first one. So I can say I want a pair of a natural number, call it m, such that something. And this something should say that m is less than n. So this is the type of pairs of natural numbers that are smaller than n. Okay, so that's a type. And how do we know that this represents the same thing as fin? It's not literally the same type, right? Because fin was declared as a data type. This is declared as a sigma type, and, and these are not the same. Um, but we can say that they are almost the same if we can translate between them in such a way that we don't lose any information if we go there and back again. So this is called an isomorphism, which I think we will cover later as well. But for now, I can just define a two function, which says that for every n, I can go from fin n to fin prime n. And I want to define a from function, which says for every n, I can go from fin prime n to fin n. Okay, and then later, I would like to show that if I first do a to and then a from, then I get back to where I started. So for all n in n, and for all x in fin prime n, if I do two n from n x, and that's the same as x. So here I'm using this equality type that we talked about briefly earlier. Right. Right. Because if I don't insist on this, then I do have many ways to translate between these that are not really respecting the data. Right? I can map everything to zero most of the time, unless n is zero itself, and so on. And similarly, I want this the other way around. If I start using the to function and then do the from function, then I get the same thing. Gratuitous, Tony. Okay, but before I can even prove this, I have to define the functions, right? Uh, so let's see what I have here. So I can fully normalize it. So I have a data thing <coughs> n. And I have to produce a pair of a natural number and a proof that it's smaller than n. Okay, so because I have something which is defined in a data type, it's probably a good idea to pattern match on it because I need to know which constructor it was built from. Right? So I need to pattern match on this x. And then we see that's either a fin zero or a fin suck. And by pattern matching on the fin, Agda actually had to refine what the n could possibly be. It had to be suck of something because these things only target suck of something. Right? Yeah. So when you see uh, a dot in a pattern in Agda, that's notation for I'm not asking you, I'm telling you. It's because we looked at this for zero and successor. There's no choice about what this is. It has to be a success. Yeah. So we're just recording the fact that we're not actually testing for a successor in this position. That this is some free, from free knowledge we get from the fact that there was a constructor here at all. And then I, I don't. I think the dot looks a bit ugly, so I'm going to remove it. <laughs> and then I'm going to turn this into an N. Okay. And then here. So now we have 
our zero in fin n, and we have to come up with some natural number which is smaller than suck of n, right? Because by matching on zero here, we refine this to be suck of something. Um, okay, but I want, really want this zero to be mapped to the natural number zero here, right? So I'm going to say this has to be a pair of something and something. And I want this to really be zero. And then here now I have to give a proof that zero is suck of n, but that's easy. So let me just get back tt. Yeah, would that have worked automatically? Just the whole right hand side? In the control C, control A? Yep. And indeed. <laughs> and um, yeah, we paid that. Um, you know. I mean, the problem is now if I try to do auto in this goal, uh, yeah. It will, it will do the same happily thing, do the right, same that, thing. So um, I don't want to rely on auto. I really want to think a little bit about what I want this to be. Uh, because in this case, uh, right, um, I want this to be suck of something, right? Uh, Quite. Right, OK, it's a little bit too clever. Um, so I say suck of something here, um, but then I think right. it's complaining about this goal. So, okay, so let me start the other way around because how should I do this? Well, I probably want to do a recursive call on X, right? So X is a fin N, so if I do two of N X, uh, that's going to give me a fin prime of n, which if I fully normalize it, is some natural number such that that number is smaller than n. Right. Um, so I could do this in a let. Because I want a pattern match on these two components here. Right. And then here, to give back something, and here I want to say suck of k. And then here now, I need that suck of k is smaller than suck of n, but if I fully normalize that, we define that to be the same thing as k being less than n, and that's exactly what the p we had from the recursive call is. Right, so we can use the same p. Like putting in brackets here. Uh, so we recursively translate the x and then we stick a suck in front of it. Right? And, and the same proof works. Anything to say about that? Um, uh, no, really. No? Uh, it's fortunate that let does the right thing here. Um, that we're allowed to take pairs apart in less. Yeah. And that's often the way. You'll also notice that uh, we're, uh, we're setting ourselves up for an easy proof, for easy proofs of these twos and froms by making sure that the, the zero from fin turns into the zero from nat together with a boring proof. And the successor from fin turns into the successor from that kind of copying across the proof that we we picked up we copying across the the trivial proof that we picked up here when we realize in the base case we realized we have plenty of slack and then when you've got a successor here and a successor here you know you've got that the same amount of slack will will do you see what i mean uh you know when you put when you add one to both sides they stay the same distance apart so this sort of the same proof goes through. Okay, so let's also look at this. So this time we have we have a pair and we have to produce a data fin. Right. Let's start by taking the pair apart. So it's some number and some proof. Okay. And then again we probably want to actually look at this number, right? So the pattern match on K. Uh, it's either zero or a successor. Okay. Now I wouldn't do that. Well, 
I mean, I think you can do it both ways. You can either you start can, by looking at the end or... You can do it both ways, but you've got to get used to this. So let's just think about it. Uh, what you got here, <coughs> you got this hypothesis P, and P computes. So you're only going to learn something useful if you can persuade P to actually show you something. Right. So uh, you should right. ask, how does P compute? Right, so they read the definition it. of P and say, what, what does P look at first? And the P, thing on the right. Yeah. Okay, so they redefine P to be a bit cle more clever. Uh, so, so here we should look at the thing on the right because yeah. that will provoke P to do some work. And note, we can't pattern match on P, right? Because yeah, it's, this is not an inductive, this is not a data declaration. Um, so we have to make this compute. Uh, and we start doing that by looking at n. So pattern match on n. What's going on there? That's always the game. The question you should always ask yourself when you're doing a proof is, why is it stuck? Why does this program not do any further computation? Which, what information does it need to make a step? Right, okay, and then... Right, this is cool. In this case, we <laughs> only need to deal with the suck case because Agda is clever enough to see that if n was zero then we would have a p of the empty type which is impossible. All right. So you know we're, we've got progress already if we if we've got under this bound the bound is not zero. This okay. is also good from the point of view of producing an output because now our goal is then suck n and we know it's got that type's got some data in it. Yeah. But now we have to not just look at the types, but look at what we want to happen, right? Because since the output is suck n, we could just return zero here, and, and that would fit the type. But we actually want it to be the number that corresponds to this k, right? So now I'm going to pattern match on the k. And it's going to be zero or suck. If it is zero, then, well, there's no content in, in the proof that zero is less than suck n anymore. Boring. <laughs> but I can return zero, right? And if it's a suck, well, then I want to return a suck. And that fits because we are targeting a suck n. And then here, I just want to continue translating the k. So say from n k. Ah, but. It's k together with some proof that k is less than n. But that's exactly what the p has computed to. Uh, right, so we see that we're turning 0 to 0 and suck to suck. And then we keep doing that, so we're going to get the same thing. Um, right, so I wonder if we should just leave these as exercises, perhaps. Yeah, although it might be good. Should we do one of them? No, I think it's. It, I think the good thing to do is to take one more look at less than. And as a as a definition. And invite you to consider uh, how much information there is in one of these proofs. So this thing computes out either to. Uh, the unit type, which stores zero bits of information, or the empty type, which stores negatively many bits of information, impossibly small, there's no information, <laughs> right? Uh, no positive bits of information. Uh, yeah, you, uh, yeah, minus infinity, basically. Uh, so yeah, there are no bits here. There's no, there, there are no, there's no way to, there's one, there's, nobody argues about like how, how many ways five is less than seven, right? The evidence here, it, these things are either trivial or impossible. What I'm trying to say is there's no data in the proof. So here, when you've got fin prime being a pair of a natural number and a proof, uh, you know, this thing which contains no bits of information. All the data is in the number. So it's like there's some data in the number, and then there's some data-free 
uh, evidence that the number was okay, but you don't learn anything else about, you, you don't get any more actual honest bits of data. So in terms of how you prove equations like this, right, um, two, two, two of these spin prime things are going to be the same if they have the same number. So uh, another thing to learn is to ask, where are the bits? And in thin prime, the bits are in the number, not. Um, uh, and then all we're doing is we're saying, the bits are in the number, but some numbers aren't allowed. Yeah. Um, the, the other thing to comment here is that mm. if you want to do this, this is the goal, mm. right? Then the exercise is exactly the same as before. Why is it stuck? Yes. We see we have the to function and the from function, and they are defined by pattern matching. So the only way to make this left-hand side to turn into something else that looks more like the right-hand side is to pattern match on the same thing as we did up here. So we can see uh, the two is stuck because it doesn't know what the n is. It's pattern matching on the n. And it's also pattern matching on its second argument, so it's stuck because it doesn't know what this is. Right? Yeah. And the from is stuck because it's, again, pattern matching on, on these things. So we have to pattern match on the same things to make it compute, and then hopefully this will simplify to something that looks like the right-hand side in each case. Yeah, so you should, well, what I'm talking about when I talk about the bits is it's not meant to be uh, scary, it's meant to be reassuring. You can see by inspection that both of these functions turn zero on the left into zero on the right, suck on the left, suck on the right. So the numbers are and the same in the other direction. So the numerical components of the data are going to match on the nose because, you know, yeah. they're in, you know, by inspection, uh, you're, you're in good shape on that one. And then if, if, the, X, if X is zero, then we're going to turn it to zero, and then we're going to turn that back into the zero we started from. As meanwhile, well. the proof components shouldn't get in your way at all because they're boring, right? Uh, if the proof if the proof exists at all, there's exactly one of it. So there's no way they can be different. Uh, so, uh, so you can see we're definitely getting the numbers right, and there's nothing exciting happening in the proofs. So these ought to be a no-brainer. But okay, let's get back to where we left off last yeah. time, which was that. We had defined this junction as saying, well, you either have to say that it's the first one or you have to say there's the second one with these two constructions. Right. And then we said that with this notion of this junction, it is not the case that you have A or not A for every A, right? Because that would mean that you have to decide if A is empty or not for each A, which, which you can't in general because a could be the type of proofs that a certain Turing machine holds. Then you have to decide if it holds or not. Yes. Uh, uh, but we can define the notion of what it means to have A or not A, and this is what we call for a type to be decidable. We can decide if we have an element of A or if it's impossible that we have an element of A. So deck of A we define to be A or not a right and then maybe we should give an example of this so i'll set this up and Let's then you can take over do it. Yes. Yes. <laughs> uh, so i'm claiming that for any two n and m it is decidable if n is less than m or not right so maybe you can see if you can Okay. Show this. Um, right. So that's our goal. Well, I'm going to want to get my hands on the data. So let's see. Right. Um, okay. So. Uh, 
we need to decide whether n is less than m is true or not. Um, and we don't know anything about n or m yet. Um, but with the magic words, why is it stuck? Perhaps you can give me some advice as to what to look at. What's less than going to look at? Which are not going to give it? Well, we were certainly interested in zero, but which, which of the two? We've got two variables to look at in order to get more information. We're going to look at m, because that's what less than is going to look at. And in particular, if m turns out to be zero, we're going to get very easy win. Let's look at m. And this is another example where you could just not think and look <laughs> at everything. Right? Pat them out on everything you can see. Um, and it would work. It would just be more work for you because you have more cases than you need to. Because if you stop and think and say, well, if I look at M first, then I get fewer cases to consider. Yeah. Okay. So when M is zero, N less than M computes to false. Bottom. Okay. So can we decide that? Yeah. Which is, you know, which do we believe, false or not false? <laughs> I think, um, I feel lucky. Also, that means I don't have to figure out how to type a Unicode subscript to. Uh, <laughs> okay. Uh, and you'd see it, it really did give us that proof of uh, not false that we had earlier. Um, not false means false implies false. So the identity function will do nicely. Everybody cool so far? You know, look at the second number. If it's zero, we're definitely in the false case. If, on the other hand, we're in, we've got a successor on the right, then the future's up for grabs. Uh, and, uh, well, again, we can just play, why is it stuck? Uh, what does less than want to know? Yeah, it wants to know what's on the left. So let's feed it some information and see what happens. Okay, and now you can see here, I'll go zero less than suck m, that should compute. If we focus in on that goal, it does compute. We are asked to decide true. And there again, you know, which are we going to pick, right? True or not true? Which do we believe? <laughs> we, better, we better go left. And again, I'm going to do that with I feel lucky in order to avoid typing Unicode. Okay, so we're left with the double successor case and kind of uh, morally, this ought to be a case of peel off the potato, one potato from each side and, and go again. One nice thing happens here is that because of the, our particular choice of how to define less than computationally, when we look at the goal, it actually computes to saying decide the problem with one number less on both sides. So I feel lucky. Um, it just, we can just plug in the recursive call directly. Right? Deciding suck n less than suck m is deciding n less than m. So it's kind of Nice that we didn't even have to do case analysis on the result of the recursive call to say, oh, well, if n is less than m, then suck n is less than suck m. Because by, you know, we don't have to do that because they're, uh, by definition, you know, the same proposition. So there we go. Our, our, um, uh, our definition of less than led straightforwardly to the proof that less than is decidable. 
And that's where your Haskell Boolean has gone. Right? This thing says, give me a bit. Did we go left or right? That's one bit of information. You've paid for a Boolean, but it's not just any old random thing that lives in type bool. You actually know what that Boolean means. You actually get some record of what the hell it was you tested. It is not a big surprise that there are values of type bool. The fact that true is of type bool and that false is of type bool is, is not a surprise to anyone. It's not, it's value as evidence for stuff is only if you actually remember what the hell it was you tested. And here, we are on the one hand saying, actually, n less than m is a sufficiently tractable thing that we can test it, that we can show it's definitely it's either true or false, and we can compute which. We're also getting the message that, yeah, there is a bit of information, and we remember what that bit means. Right, so I wonder what we should do now, if we yes. should just do this example, uh, and postpone for all and exists, or if we yeah, should... Yeah, we've had a bit of exists already, but uh, yeah. to some extent. Um, uh, I mean, we could say something about for all, because we've just proven um, a universal proposition. All right, so... Right, so maybe, yeah, yes. maybe let's skip ahead to for all then. Yeah, so the yeah, point here is that this, this dependent function type which says, if you give me two numbers, n and m, I will give you back some data about n and m, corresponds to a universally quantified proposition in predicate logic. And indeed, um, uh, you know, uh, yeah, this is where Curry Howard, the idea that proofs and programs are, are doing the same sort of thing uh, really does uh, show up where uh, you know, we use functions from data to types, so to sets of evidence about the data, uh, to allow us to code up quantifiers, so like the universal quantifier here, for all, you know, how do you show uh, that, that P holds for all natural numbers, you give a program which takes the number you're interested in as an input and gives you evidence for P of N as an output. The universal quantification uh, is nothing other than giving the type for a dependently typed function. Yeah, dependent function type is exactly making a universal logical statement. And uh, and our earlier, um, so yeah, we've just proven the logical statement that for all, for all n and m in the natural numbers, it, it is decidable whether n is less than m. It's a perfectly reasonable logical statement. It's also a very sensible type of a program that actually computes a useful bit, given two numbers. Right, so this is how we represent for all, right? And then here we had, uh, so if you have a proof of for all, so this is how you introduced it, right? You're saying to show for all n p of n, you show p of n for every n, uh, which as a program means you take n as an argument and then you, you give something of type p of n, right? And the other way around, if you have for all n p of n and you want p of m for some particular m, well, then we can apply a to m. Right? Okay, so it's a generalizable variable, so it's not going to play nicely with the holes, but if I give it like this, and it really doesn't like it, okay. 
you can leave it as an underscore otherwise you know right or, or i can introduce it explicitly here right right so or, or indeed i guess for all introduction is generalization otherwise known as writing a function you know you can do it with a lambda and uh for all elimination is specialization specializing a universal statement to one particular value is nothing other than giving the function an argument feeding some data in and uh, isn't it kind of one of the marvelous things about cs410 is our um our other slogan is see there was only one idea so uh, you know we how did we leave it till fourth year to tell you that logic and functional programming is same shit different day mm -hmm. okay let's see if we can make sense of this and do this and then then we should stop uh, so if you read this as a logical formula it says that if i know that for all m p of m holds and q m m holds then i can move the and outside the for all and i know that for all m p of m holds and i know for all m q of m holds so if i try to prove this then i write a function of this type uh, so i take an argument of this type and now I have to give something of this type and remember the and was defined with one constructor which produces pairs of things so I'm going to produce a pair of two things okay and then here I have to show for all m p of m so I take an n and now I have to give p of n but my a says that for all n1 i know p of n1 and q of n1 so if i do a of n that's going to give me p of n and q of n and then we have this first projection which gives me the first part of that similarly here i have to show for all n q of n okay and i can do a of n that gives me p of n and q of n so if i take the second projection of this that gives me the q so i've proven a logical formula but i just did it small steps by writing a program didn't worry too much about what the logic meant um, so that's that's the way we do these things right? I to put in an extra bracket okay uh, you have one minute for final remarks connor um mm, well just that um uh, yeah, this, what yeah. we're uh, uh, we're in this kind of funny world where we're doing functional programming, but with types that are now rich enough uh, to say something interesting logically. Meanwhile, in in logic land, uh, we're doing something which looks like logic, but makes you a stronger promise than classical logic normally does namely uh that you're actually going to get some when the logical formula promises you a disjunction you're actually going to know which side you can and when a logical formula promises you that something exists you know what it is you can actually get your hands on the data so what we're really doing is uh, bookkeeping the computational content of logical arguments. Uh, and that's why we have this kind of, this notion of decision, of decidability. That's really saying, you know, not all logical statements can be decided computationally in a way that hands you the bit which says whether it's true or false. And it's, a useful extra thing on top of the logical statement to say, well, we can actually compute this. So this is logic plus book kept computability from the logical point of view. And from a functional programming point of view, it's writing types for programs that actually tell you 
the meaning of the inputs and the outputs. Okay, uh, so we'll, we'll finish tomorrow by doing exists, and then Guillaume has a plan for us what we'll do next. Uh, okay, good. Let's stop this recording.